Welcome. I was going to say from a very sunny Dorset, but the sun's gone in. So um, hope you are all well wherever you are. Um, so uh, this morning, delighted to have um, our project management virtual career chat with two of my most favourite people. Uh, one, a previous Bill Force candidate and another, a staunch supporter and active employer. Um, so sit back, enjoy. Over to you, Angela. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Bill Force virtual career, career chat with me, Angela Forbes. It is a pleasure to welcome you this morning, so thank you for dialing in. So we are all freshly off the back of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and it was a glorious affair. And if you took part, be it ceremonial duty or otherwise, well done you. London played the role of host spectacularly well, and I am still buzzing from being at the event. So I hope you and your family and community celebrated it too. And the week before that, Build Force had their very triumphant HS2 Insight Day on the HS2 line in Coventry with host Balfour Beatty Vinci. So the site visit astonished all those who took part and the day itself was incredible. So well done to all those who secured jobs on the day. And we are still scheduling in interviews off the back of conversations that you had with the employers. So a massive well done to Caroline for another remarkable event. Now, for our chat this morning, we welcome Jacobs and Lysander to discuss project management. So we'll hear from Michael Taylor from Lysander and Rob Kelly from Jacobs. So without further ado, we'll pass over to Michael to kick us off. We'll take questions at the end, so feel free to write in any comments as we go and we'll switch our cameras off, Michael. Uh, thanks, Carol and Angela. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, uh, Michael Taylor, I'll go in. I've got a little bit of a presentation just to keep me a little bit focused and keep me on track a little bit. Um, I'll go through that and then I'll hand over back over to the ladies and then Rob as well. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share this. If someone can just let me know you see it and then we'll just get started. That's it. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Taylor. Um, I work for a company called Lysander. Um, and just to go through on this here, okay, like every usual presentation, there's a little bit of an agenda, so I'll just go through a few bits and points, and I'll just go over them, and then at the end of it, I've got some general advice, and again, it's not limited to, um, I could probably talk forever and a day, um, having been in the opposition, um, so a little bit about my military and how I got there and then we'll go into a little bit about Lysander, a bit of resettlement advice and then certainly the types of project management you've got. Um, typical day in life again that's not limited to and some maybe some of the benefits as why well. you might want to consider going into project management and then again as I said a little bit of advice at the back end of it. So myself I was in the Royal Engineers for 24 years um, so initial trade was a draftsman, electrical, mechanical. Um, I'll just turn my camera off, actually. No one needs to see this face. There we go. Um, so initial trade draftsman. So I was involved with a lot of the designs and drawing up the pretty pictures for the designers and also the people building. Um, so I've always had a, back, a background in the construction side. Um, halfway through my career, I decided to retrade as a Karkowitz construction. So. This is pretty much, for those that don't know, is pretty much the jack of all trades within the construction, the architects, the project managers, the QS, um, you name it, everything from concepts all the way through to delivery and also facilities management at the back end of it as well. So quite a varied um, experience in that regards. Um, and then some of the deployments, I'd say, like most people probably on this call, Iraq, Afghan, um, I even got to Somalia and I also did um, post earthquake relief in in Nepal as well. Um, so some of those drawings are there. Uh, sorry, photos. Uh, this one up at the top obviously gives you an idea of the houses. And then this one here was actually a facility that I oversaw and constructed down in Somalia. Um, so quite a lot of great experience before I got out and some of the qualifications was the foundation of construction management. And then my last job was teaching project management for APM PMQ and also MS projects. So I was sort of like the go to certainly within 
um, the core and also a little bit of the MOD. So it was tri service that I was teaching and also Ministry of Defence and anyone else that wanted to listen to my voice for a week. Um, so I, I got the APM qualification, MSP, so Management Successful Programs, Management of Risk, and then the SMSTS, which I'll mention later on. Um, that kind of put me in the perfect position really for getting out the, the army. And I decided to take up a role for Lysander. I'd never heard of Lysander before. Um, and it was another um, candidate, uh, Michael Dryden, who contacted me through after Caroline had sent out my CV to, um, to him. They got in contact and I'll talk a little bit more about Lysander. So that's pretty much a brief snapshot of kind of my transition through um, the military in that regards. Um, so my current role then is I'm a senior PM uh, within Lysander and I'm quite fortunate at the moment that I have been given the mess, uh, West Midlands interchange. So uh, just to give you a little bit of an orientation, um, this is the M6, that's the A5 and then just along here we've got the A449. Um, it's three uh, sorry 734 acres uh currently of green and brown site that we're developing with i've got a strategic rail into um real freight interchange which is essentially like um the freight trains come in and get loaded and unloaded but we're building a terminal for that off the west coast main line so we've got national rail um interface there i'm conducting i'm building three 14 industrial units uh, just to give you an idea, that one there is approximately 350 metres long, so quite um, beefy um, size unit in that side. Um, we are building new infrastructure on the highway side of it, so we're building some road systems and we're also doing a, um, some works on existing infrastructure as well. So we're getting a lot of interface with national highways and also the councils that own the roads. Um, currently, there's uh, 132 kV and 11 kV uh, pylons that go across the site are going to have to drop down into the ground. So we're getting involved with the Western Power Distribution, um, all that good stuff. Currently, this area here is predominantly a quarry, an operating quarry. That tenant's about to move and we're doing a lot of remediation works within there. Um, so ground investigation, soil trials, etc. Um, and currently, I think the cost is probably about one and a half billion at the moment. So that's my project that I'm kind of controlling and leading. And I'll talk about a little bit more about the difference between PMs as well later on. So a little bit about Lysander then. So we get involved in the industrial, commercial, um, residential records management and also the data as well. So it's quite quite a varied, but we're primarily um, focused around logistical construction. So the big massive warehouses that you see around the country and the logistical hubs, we get involved with that a lot. Um, we work directly with developers. So we are usually on the client side. We can do the delivery, um, but primarily that's where our focus sits, really these three. The residential, when they talk about the residential, we're talking about properties that kind of overlook Buckingham Palace. Um, so it's the high end residential that we've got a team that embeds in that and they advise the clients and project manage that from start to finish and go through all, all the interfaces. And then the data centres, that's um, the likes of Google that we're kind of working through. And this is kind of um, growing arms and legs at the moment. So we've expanded out into the data centres. So I do believe we are delivering a, a project over in Milan. Um, across Europe and we're getting involved with the likes of those. We do have other, um, some of our kind of uh, clients that we operate with is the likes of Amazon, Land Rover, BMW, Jaguar, um, obviously Google. So we are hitting the big players in regards to what we're doing and delivering. So our services were pretty much um, around project management. So our business is essentially into two areas that are the primary focuses, and that's project management and cost management. So QS, um, so you're involved with the contracts, um, providing quotes on um, the build materials and you're kind of working through that. We do have building surveyors, so we'll go out and we'll do uh, building surveyors, certainly do for a lot of feasibility reports for clients. 
and we do development advice, so due diligence. Um, so one of our clients has is looking to buy, purchase some land. We'll go in there and do due diligence report, give them the pros and cons of it, certain uh, pitfalls, and hopefully give them a rough cost of what it would be to develop. And then we do fund monitoring as well on behalf of the clients. So quite a varied um, organisation. Um, so we are we have four sites currently within the UK. So Newcastle, Northampton, London, and the head office, which is Godalming in Surrey. Um, the business has gone from in the last probably year and a half to two years have gone from a couple of hundred to so probably about 500 now. So we are growing exponentially all the time and we're continuously looking for new people. Um, we do operate across Europe, as I said, Madrid, Milan, um, in Germany. So if you are German speaking and you want a job as a QS or PM, give me a shout because we can probably um, help with that as we are looking for various people. So that's Lysander in a nutshell. Um, again, if you want to know more about Lysander, it's a great organisation and we've got two managing directors, a couple of direct um, directors underneath them, and then the rest is senior PMs and PMs. So quite a shallow organisation. So you have direct routes to the MDs and it's a great organisation to work with. So back onto what we're here for then. Um, so resettlement advice. So I've got a couple of points in here and I'll elaborate as and when. Um, but the first key thing is try and understand and know yourself a little bit before this. And I've got in there in brackets, it, it's OK not to know what you want to do at this point. Um, up until probably about six months before I got out, um, I didn't actually know what I wanted to do. Um, clearly, I was I was kind of streamlined for project management because that was the role that I was doing and I was teaching. Um, but I still didn't know if I wanted to do that. So my advice is don't worry about it. Don't stress about it. OK, it will happen once you start networking and having conversations, getting in with Bill Force. And I'll talk about a little bit about Bill Force later on, which I'm sure the ladies have as well. But, you know, they're a great organisation and they're there to help you. OK, so you've got your CV, you'll put on there your key skills. So that's your hard and your soft. So your hard, you know, project management, financial, you know, you know, the professional kind of elements. And then you, you kind of, um, your soft is like your communications, your empathy, motivation, all that kind of stuff. The stuff that we have been absolute bucket loads due to the type of works and experience that we've had across any of our projects and also our works as well. OK, so but understand where your weaknesses are. So once you start networking and I'm chatting to people, you'll start and you'll probably start seeing the gaps within your experience and knowledge. There's nothing wrong with that uh, gap. OK, and then you can just decide to take on either before you get out or it can be part of your kind of onboarding when you discuss with the um, with the next um, employer. You can say, well, I don't have that, but I'm willing to do the training. OK, so that's one way around it if you if you don't have that at that particular time. So don't stress about it, but it's definitely worth understanding your strengths and weaknesses. OK, um, it'd be advisable. You know, advisable if you knew where you wanted to live, if you haven't already got a property and where you want to work out of. So living and working from is totally different. My last job, I was living, um, I was working down south. I live in Nottingham, so I was commuting weekly. Um, I decided I didn't really want to be driving long distances. So um, being on the client side, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, gave me that opportunity. And also I was static. So the reason I picked Nottingham, I could go up, down, left or right quite easy for me. And so it was kind of a bit of a strategic decision, really. Um, identify what interests you. You know, if, if you like, you know, finance, by all means, going to finance. If you like project management, getting a new challenge on a daily basis, problems identifying itself all the time and go working through those problems with the consultants and communicating with clients. I kind of like talking to people, so it kind of worked out well. And as I've said, I've done quite a bit. Um, working from home or the office, again, this is qu probably quite prevalent at the moment, certainly off the back end of COVID. Um, Lysander have pretty much assisted me in setting up my office, so they give me kit and equipment and, you know, they've paid for my office chair, and additional screens, etc, etc. Um, but, you know, 
working from home if you haven't then it, it's a bit of a strange beast so you need to decide if you're comfortable working from home some people don't like to do it so understanding that so when you start going into the conversations and maybe packages later on that you kind of identify what you are looking to do if you want to be in an office because you want to be around people all the time then that's probably something and that might tailor you towards a specific niche or a certain direction whether they're either a company or um and the type of work that you want to do okay um, i've kind of mentioned it as well identify your gaps in your knowledge and experience that's not a bad thing that's a good thing in my opinion because it knows what you what you can and can't do and but then you can communicate that and you can also maybe negotiate some package where they uh, actually take you on um reach out okay so i got hung up on this pretty early i didn't want to pester people i didn't want to you know um bother people too much but as one of my friends when i when i had a chat with him on teams who works with another organization he just said you've got to get over it you know and it was a great bit of advice he says don't you know don't be stressed out about that just get on linkedin start connecting you know when you start doing your um you know, your transition you go to your transition workshop they'll talk about linkedin and then put in you know a message on you when you connect you know you can do that or you can just do it because it's a like for like um very you know it's it's quite good and certainly linkedin um is a lot of lysander's roles kind of get put on linkedin so it'd be the directors or the managing directors because they're obviously the business end of it they'll they'll put the job roles on there or certainly people that they're looking for and if you're interested get in touch so develop your network don't be afraid to reach out and speak to people okay um speak to people within the roles and the organizations that you're interested in you know if you ask for like five minutes of their time i'm pretty sure they will happily speak to you um and i kind of allude to it later on i from my experience no military person will ever say no um, you might not get a lot of their time but you'll certainly get you know a conversation going and they'll give you advice um so utilize it as much as you can reach out connect speak with people and get that information um your cv develop it obviously in the third person i'm not going to go into too much of that there's other workshops and seminars and etc i'll talk to you about in depth what i will say is pick a format that works for you um you'll you'll see you'll see various um different formats out there i kind of turned myself inside out trying to please everybody um i can in the end i kind of got a little bit ratty about it and decided that works for me and that's what i'm going with um and personally i did quite a bit of work on it it, it, it worked out fine um so have a look at what's out there have a look at other people's cvs and then just pick what's right for you and how that portrays you across to the organization. Uh, tailor your CV to the role. It's really important you do this. Every time I get a CV, one of the first things that if I start seeing a CV and they're talking, you know, as a project manager, it's all about delivering projects. It's all about uh, communication, risk management. If I don't see that in the write up and it's a generic one and you start talking about logistical um, networks and bits and pieces, whilst that is important, it's not tailored to project management and so straight away you kind of on a back foot straight away with that person reading it so tailor it to the job identify the key points within the um, advertisement and then just tweak it and change it and put those buzzwords and put pepper them throughout any of your communicate uh, the correspondence that you put in in your cv it's a it's a brilliant thing and then they can start picking out those buzzwords but if you don't do that you're up against people that have tailored it and they're not going to um um pro progress you or it's highly unlikely to progress you it just it just enhances your opportunities a little bit again i put it in brackets there and i bolded it it's my preference i i made a conscious decision to take out all you know terminology of roles military terminology so you know if you're raf and you're a squadron leader a civilian doesn't understand what a squadron leader is you know so i just basically equated my roles to what it would be called in a civilian industry and kind of hit that at that level and and the terminology you know you talk about a section or a squadron they don't know what a section or a squadron is if you're a section then you ran um, a team of up to 12 people um, and then that way they can equate okay so you've man managed um, they've man managed um, 12 persons they've coordinated activities etc the reason i say that is 
if you submit a CV and it's got military information running all the way through it, the first thing it's going to happen is it's going to come across to myself or one of my other colleagues and we will have to decode it. There could be something very key within your CV that I overlook, but it's critical to the MD. So the MD is asking me to decode it. If I miss it, I don't put that across to the MD. Straight away, you're on a back foot as well because I don't know what they're talking about or what they're looking for. So by doing that, you, you've already decoded your CV and so they can understand it. So you go straight to the heart of, you know, straight to the right people um, in the first instance. Um, only use relevant qualifications. So I'm a personal safety public order instructor, a ski instructor. Whilst they're great, they're not necessarily relevant to project management. Uh, what it does mean, obviously, you can put it down as an interest later on as a talking point, but actually in the CV, just try and tailor the qualifications that are pertinent and useful to that role. Um, loads of resources out there and utilise them to the best. You've got Buildforce, clearly. So these these ladies can and the organisation can sort out site visits, different roles. So if you're unsure on the types of roles that you want to do, reach out to these ladies. They can get you placed in there for a period of time, which you can use as part of your uh, GRT as well. And you can get on these roles and it'd be a great insight to um, what that role is about. Certainly what the role is going to require for you. And you can start networking with that organisation as well. And that can actually lead to employment. Uh, interview preps, um, CV reviews and connecting with mentors. So like myself, um, quite often I've, I've had chats with people and we go through their CV and actually do some those and just go through a few bits and pieces. Defence Academy, there's loads of free courses on Defence Academy, which you guys can access and link into. And then your resettlement grants, your ELCs, your SLCs. They're there for a reason. Just utilise them and max them out as much as you can. Uh, be quite frugal with it because it's not an inexhaustible amount of money and some of these courses can be quite expensive and that kind of links into knowing your gaps. For me, I utilised my um, my resettlement grant, I think it's £534, um, and I pretty much spent that on a finance um, course that I did, but that's because I didn't have much finance experience and I wanted to understand the terminology, so now I'll be running budgets, etc. There's loads of webinars and YouTubes and professional bodies out there that can assist you as well. So um, there's great information in there. So that's kind of some of the um, elements. I've kind of alluded to types of construct um, project managers. You've got essentially two facets, really. And I say construction because if you type in project management, there's so much array out there. So you have the delivery side and site based. So that tends to be the, con the contractors actually on the site day in, day out working on those. So I kind of broke them down. CSCS card, if you're going to be on site, you need a CSCS card for actually getting on site. And the SMSTS, so Site Manager's Safety Training Scheme, um, that's key. Certainly if you're going in on a delivery PM role, you will need that as that's a health and safety across the site. Again, it's not hard and fast, but HNC, HND for the older crew, and also maybe a higher qualification, not critical, and it would be tailored to that organisation as to what they're looking for. Um, also, MVQs, which are a great way of people getting through on qualifications and actually picking up the relevant experience and quals as well. Professional bodies, usually around MCIOB, they could be ICE, they could be anything that's pertinent to that organisation. Once you get into that organisation, you identify what certain kind of governing bodies that they kind of look towards. So. Lysander is RICS, so Royal Institute of um, Chartered Surveyors, That, because obviously that's quite a big uh, facet for us, and also uh, CIOB as well. So we, they're the two that we kind of, a lot of people go for. Um, maybe some courses that are useful, but not critical. First aid, scaffold inspection, contracts. If you're going contractor side, the contractors tend to be ninjas at their contracts. They know their contracts inside out. So you have an awareness of JCT and NEC, it does help you. It is not critical at that point. If they want you to have more in depth, there are they will put you through on those courses and they will train you on them. But to get your foot in the door, if you have an awareness and you're able to talk about them, certainly your interviews, then it's great. Got the IOSH and the NEBOSH as well, um, if you haven't already got them. Again, NEBOSH, general construction, 
Um, general is more about the laws and statutory bodies and then your construction, clearly, as the title says, construction. So that's the delivery side. So you will be on site quite a lot throughout that week. You'll have multiple sites. You'll probably do a lot of traveling, certainly on that side. And then you've got the consultancy and the client side, which is what I am. Sometimes referred to as the client's agent, certainly by the contractors. OK, so again, CSCS card because you will be visiting sites, usually the black one because it's the, um, the management side. Um, preferable if you had some kind of PM qual, whether that be APM, PMQ, Prince2, Agile, all of them are great and it kind of gives you the fundamental base of that. It's not essential, but if you are going into project management, I would probably suggest that you try and get one of those calls or even the training for it. OK, usually a degree or higher that again, it, it's neither here nor there. Um, it, it really does depend on the organisation and what they're looking for, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, professional bodies, as I've already said, APM, RICS, ICE, MCIOB, depend on what kind of industry you're working for, so I logistical or you're going to be um, a house developer, you know, home developer, then, you know, you'll have more one that's tailored to the other. Uh, useful calls then, management risk, earn value management, so a way of tracking your cost against your planned works. Um, and it's also a good way of understanding if you're on target or not. Uh, some NEBOSH contracts, again, JCT, and maybe some finance as well, if you're going to be running some budgets. But again, that's just kind of like a snapshot. Client side, not necessarily on the ground an awful lot. So I've got a site over Wolverhampton where my site is. We're in the pre-con, but once it goes on, it'd be like once a week or something or twice a week. However, I have that flexibility to work what I want to do. Whereas if you're site based, you've got to be on the ground a lot more and you're going to be traveling to where the jobs are. So a little bit more travel. So day in the life of the PM then. Um, so I'm involved with strategic planning and programming. Um, chasing consultants, so just uh, minutes, action points from minutes, um, chasing them through, chasing up design submissions, um, asking questions, basically just communicating with them and effectively uh, against my plans and programming that I'm working with. Chairing meetings, um, hosting, um, writing minutes, distributing them, or just sitting in the back of those minutes while the technical people are talking with each other, make sure that they are talking to each other a lot more and actually talking about the right things. Um, the main one is the managing the project risks and problem solving. So project problem solving is pretty much on a day to day basis. You know, everything every day is different. Um, something always comes up and uh, certainly when construction starts, that'll be um, working primarily with the delivery managers um, and you kind of problem solving, but understanding the project risk and communicating that risk and every time a decision is made, you kind of measure it against what the risks are against the project and communicate that to the clients. Um, communicating with stakeholders. Um, so we've got a lot of community liaison engagements. We've got lots of different external organisations. So network rail, national highways. We've got a quarry. We've got a chemical plant on my site. So there's a hell of a lot of interfaces and you've got to be able to communicate with these stakeholders and holding your own against them and actually getting across what you need to and extracting that information is key as well. Um, again, directing the project team. So at the moment I've got probably know, about 10 different organisations that are consultants that are working, either advising or designing, and then managing interfaces externally to the project all the time and also working collaboratively with them. As per the design and also the programmes, it's kind of delivering that and just pushing the team in the right direction and working with the clients. So the clients decide what they want when they want it. It's understanding what can and can't be done, communicating with those to try and realise that goal, if you will. And then I put bold underneath there is learning. Continuously, every single day is learning. Um, sometimes in the military, we are sheltered in regards to some of this. So you're talking about Brian, you're talking about net zero carbon, you know, you talk about biodiversity, you know, EV stuff, that's all coming up. All the stuff that we kind of um, get sheltered a little bit, we kind of pay lip service to, but every day is something. Um, so today I'm looking at you know, getting an accessibility um, audit on some of my designs with various consultants. Never done it before, so um, it's quite a, something else that I'm trying to get to the bottom of at the moment. But 
learning on on a daily basis and i think due to the types of roles that we've always um taken on that's actually um you know second nature to a lot of us a lot of time so it's not too bad so some of the benefits then i'll quickly shoot through these flexible working hours again i'm working from home again my organization they're not too stringent on that if i want to go to and do some exercise you know that's fine as long as i'm putting in the minimum hours and doing work which i am above and beyond network across the industry i'm working with so many different consultants clients and contractors I'm networking with every single one of these, so it's it's great exposure to this. Um, depending on the type of projects and also the organisation, you have a whole raft of projects. You could be working on Amazon scheme once, the next one it could be, you know, um, a data centre, the next you could be talking about, you know, environmental projects as well. So you have an absolute vast array of projects you can be exposed to. Um, less traveling into your site based. So this is primarily from my site based, less traveling. Um, so I'm not based on site unless I want to be. I think it's more of a comfortable landing for military because we have, we've probably, as we've gone through the ranks, we, we're used to engaging with external organizations and also someone, certainly if you've worked with DIO, so they can be classed as clients and you've kind of had to interface with them and actually realise the goals. So I think it's quite a comfortable landing for an ex-military. Certainly on the management side, you know, we've got buckets, loads of experience and, and knowledge in that, in that regards. And I, I think, you know, the military are perfectly placed to be able to communicate effectively in that regards. And we're not too phased by speaking to the clients. I've said professional environment, not to not say that working on, on site is not a professional environment. It just tends to be you're working with the consultants, the clients, the higher up strategic planners, um, and that's that's all I was trying to get out there. So it tends to be more um, formal in that regard. Salary is not bad, but this also depends on what level you come in at. So junior PM, PM, senior PM, associate or director. Again, as you said there, this is taking off um, the APM um, and the links down there. So you're talking about an average about 50, but that does depend on the organisation, what you negotiate, and also um, what level you go in at as well. So I'll uh, last last but second slide then, so you won't have to listen to my voice anymore. Uh, some general advice, you will be fine. Um, it's probably the one thing that used to wind me up when I was getting out. I, I did 20 24 years in the military. My dad did 26 years in the army as well. So I was a pads brat, so it's all I ever knew. Uh, so for me, I think I, I um, put a lot of pressure and stress on myself, bigging it up more than I actually needed to. You know, yes, it was a whole change of life for me, but I promise you, you will be fine. You have absolutely loads of knowledge and experience, even if it's not construction, you have the management experience that you have in bucket loads and you've got so much of the soft skills that are now being recognised um, and rightly so. So trust yourself, I promise you, you will be fine. You need to put in a bit of graft, obviously, to get over the line, but you are going to be recognised for what you are going to bring to the party. Research your opportunities. There are lots of organisations out there. Again, this kind of links in with your networking and your, your, uh, your companies and also the build force and the opportunities do a bit of research about them. I think you can go on total jobs, uh, put in the companies and it'll actually rate those companies as well. And it is and you can see obviously comments against the company. Bear that in mind, you know, there's probably some disgruntled ones that, you know, that put some negative on there. So it kind of brings that down. But you get to read what they're about and you can gauge it in regards. I did a little bit of that, so it's not a bad thing to do. Um, see what the company's about, see what projects they're working on. Um, they like to advertise what they, what's coming up. So, you know, we've been awarded this contract. It might be something really interesting that really kind of focuses with you and it might be geographically amazing for you. Um, talk to people for advice. Again, don't get hemmed up on this. If it's important to talk again, this is going to, you know, you're probably feeling a bit of stress. Um, as I said, I put a lot of my, a lot of uh, stress on myself, but talking to people is great for the mental health but also it's great for the advice and no one was going to turn you away and say, no, I'm not going to talk to you. Um, again, I'll put my contact details on. If you ever need any chat, if you just want to just vent, by all means do it. You know, there's positive and negatives for getting out, um, which we can probably talk about another time. Um, 
reach out and connect. From my experience, as I said, no military will ever turn you away, and certainly Bill Force as well. Wealth of experience, no one's going to turn you away. Don't be afraid to say no. Not every opportunity is for you. Um, if you're in an, if you're discussing potential job roles, if something comes up and they're like, we kind of see you going in this direction, and it's just something you don't want to do. There's nothing wrong with saying no. Don't be, yeah, okay, just because you you kind of really desperate to get over the line and get a job. You know, find what works for you, take a bit of time, take a step back, assess it, and don't be afraid to say no. Um, use all the resources available to you. Uh, again, I've mentioned Bill Force and everything else on the resources. I'm sure the ladies will touch on that. Um, practice your interviews. Um, I've got a friend and I've got her to pose uh, questions to me. Um, but the one question, I had three interviews in the end, three job offers. Every one of them asked me that question in red. Tell me about yourself. It's quite a difficult question. And I think I've got it down to eight minutes and it's essentially your sales pitch. So practice it. And what I did is I, I kind of rambled. I recorded myself and I timed it and then I listened back and then I typed it all up. And I just kept going through it and going through it and going through it and refining it, refining it until I had it down to about seven and a half, eight minutes. And it's essentially everything about yourself, you, you selling yourself and also throwing out some nuggets of information that they can latch onto and start talking about that you want to direct it. So you try and direct the, um, the interview yourself. Again, it's, it's a very underrated uh, question, but certainly as a, someone that can employ, it's brilliant. Um, be yourself. Don't lie. You don't need to. Uh, just sell yourself. Have that rapport in the com in in the interviews. The Lysander interview. I came into it. I they'd already decided that they wanted me. Um, it was a very informal interview. We had a laugh with up to me and two managing directors, and we built a rapport straight away. And that is really key in building that rapport because they are assessing you whether you fit in the organisation. So be yourself. Obviously. Be careful with your black military humour. Um, doesn't always go down too well, and just be just tailor it a little bit. But you know, enjoy the process. You know, the interviews. I enjoyed every interview I had. I know it sounds weird, but I'm quite comfortable in talking in front of people. So, and then that last point then is, don't be afraid to take a step back to go forwards. So it could be, you know, some of these PM roles. They're asking you to deliver some meaty roles. If you're not necessarily comfortable, just say, look, you know, I'm willing to come in at the lower end and I'll just need a little bit more mentoring. And a lot of these organisations will also have packages as well that will take you through and mentor and guide you through them. And they will not, it's not in their interest to throw you in at the deep end so the point you fail. So don't be afraid. Again, money, I get that, you know, it's very key. If you can't afford to do it, then you just come in maybe at another level. However, one bit of advice I've always taken with me from another friend and I'm going to steal it. If you want it, don't be afraid to go for it. Don't let someone tell you you can't have it. Stand up and be counted in your interviews and in the process that you've got to that point. If you want it that bad, go for it, you know, and that's that's a key. I'm very comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, so it was fine for me. OK, so I will leave you with my contact details. I'll put them up there and then I'll hand over um, to the ladies and Rob as well. Um, thank you very much. Michael, that was incredible. Thank you very much. Um, Rob, can I ask you to switch your camera on, please? Morning, everybody. Um, thanks for that really in-depth chat then. Uh, I was really interesting just to see a different part of the market space and, and how things work in a different part of industry that I don't tend to get involved in that that much from the construction side, so really interesting. Um, so, yeah. Hi, Rob Kelly. I'm the head of military talent at Jacobs, um, and I joined Jacobs originally as a project manager. So I'm going to chat this morning is going to be more about um, how I got to Jacobs um, as a project manager, and then sort of the, the kick-on effects that I've used from the project management work that I did, and then what I've gone on to do in the business, and sort of what further avenues can play out quite quickly um, from having that turn the wheel as a project manager. So my background, um, Royal Marines senior NCO for 12 years, uh, and I left left the Marines just because the timing was right for me to leave. Um, I didn't want to be that disgruntled guy kicking at the gate to leave, so I decided to leave sort of on my own terms. Um, whilst I was leaving, I did what any usual bootneck does. I did what my mate did, and he did uh, two project management qualifications. So I did 
agile project management and Prince to thinking that I could probably get myself a job in project management. Um, and I was lucky that I found uh, myself a home very quickly actually with uh, with Jacobs. So my background, Jacobs is the uh, largest engineering um, consultancy in the world, 60,000 employees. Um, it's probably the best kept secret in industry. Nobody's ever heard of us. Um, so that's sort of a, a note that we'll go on to talk about a little bit later on about sales. Um, got brought into the business initially as a, a project manager. And the first tasking I got set with was to purchase the F-35 jet uh, on the behalf of MOD Abbey Wood as an interface between Lockheed Martin, the US Department of Defense, HM Treasury, and obviously the Royal Air Force and Royal Naval call signs using that platform. Which was a bit of a shock of capture because I had no real background in fast air apart from calling it in a few times on the ground in Afghan. So suddenly, Put into a, a very new and very raw environment client facing so on, on my own the only contractor in the team uh, and I was set out um, five work packets to take on as a junior project manager which is quite a lot um, to, to take on straight off the get-go so I was tasked with um, being the project management for procurement of the jet to do with the software and the upgrades of the software throughout the whole of the fleet the PFE the helmets the propulsion to so the actual genuine jet that gets strapped onto the back of it um, and a number of other sort of small items and miscellaneous parts etc um, and as I said my sort of my key um, key stakeholders in that fraction was between Lockheed Martin US Department of Defense and relevant OEMs from industry um, a huge amount of work to take on and suddenly having to actually dig into those two project management qualifications that I did and pick out from those qualifications what is actually usable, what is actually going to help the project and the client in this instance to achieve their goals. Um, for context, the civil servants who would have usually have been running that, that gig um, under understaffed from their side and they're not trained in those project management methodologies. They are just still very much in the raw procurement um, old school method of, of getting UK military, um, sadly, the, the wrong kit at the wrong time. So I, I sort of ruffled feathers as much as I could in, in that domain and got most of the project back on, on task, back on taskings. Um, also had the joy of getting being involved in a, uh, a lawsuit between Lockheed Martin and the US Department of Defense and indeed HM Treasury, i.e. your taxpayers' money um, for a refund of 1.7 million US dollars from Lockheed Martin to the US Department of Defence back to the UK with um, some, let's just say, errors that Lockheed Martin had made it on their books. Um, at that stage, I was sort of getting ready to leave the project about six, seven months in of that raw consultancy piece. And I was chucked, uh, as you, a lot of you will find, in the project management world, uh, a real last minute curveball from the client, i.e. you've got six weeks left of us here's this, it's definitely within your terms of reference to still deliver for us. So I was tasked with uh, the creation of a Cat A Uplift Treasury note, £280 million, pounds, um, basically turning back around to the Treasury and saying the project requires this amount of funding for a strategic facility to be built at RF Marham, which is, uh, again, a very difficult piece to pick up um, from scratch. The way that I achieved that um, was by reaching back into the Jacobs network. So you can probably see behind me there's a little tab that says net net. So that is the Jacobs in-house veterans network. Um, within that network, uh, there is a couple of ex very senior RAF officers who effectively had a drop file for me to take and run with. But then as an internal consultancy, they then helped me and produce that, that documentation to be sent off to the Treasury um, in good time, in good stead. So I had sort of a, a, an eight slash nine months real raw hard fast exposure to project management in certainly in the defence environment. Um, based out of MAD Abbey Wood, although it was predominantly remote working dur during the, uh, the height of the pandemic. At that stage, I wanted to, to change things up a bit. Project management, 
yeah, okay, it, it was good, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. And I'd sort of fallen into it, as I said, because I'd followed uh, a mate of mine to do his to do the project management courses. So I hadn't really given what job I was going to do on the outside uh, a great deal of thought. One thing that I knew that I was good at was sort of business development and sales. So um, I, I looked within for Jacob's uh, cloth again uh, on our jobs board and I managed to pick out a role that had just come live as an inside sales manager. Um, and, what, and what is that and why is that important for you all on the call today? As I said, this is going to be more how you can take the, the, your first turn the wheel as a project manager and, and a look forward. So sales is an incredibly fast paced world. So it's either inbound or, or, or outbound sales. And the particular stuff I was doing uh, was sort of chasing government bids from UK and, and foreign bids, 30 million pound gross margin upward, putting a team together, finding out if the business was interested in taking on that work and then actively applying and going through all of the hoops that you have to jump through to try and win one of these government tenders. And it was a real raw exposure. Why would this project management have anything to do with that? Well, effectively, every bid that you take on and you'd be running numerous, um, uh, many different companies, that's how they get their money's worth out of you, is to run it like, like a project management program. And you would have seen on the previous slides, you'd have seen some like Primavera P6 and so that waterfall uh, project management layout. It's very much like that. Sometimes uh, the sales world, you might be working on a sales pitch that's got a 16, 17 week um, program. So you've got a nice chunky amount of time to make a really good training program, if you like. And other times you're going to be straight into that agile world of three day turnaround. Let's just put everything we can on paper, chop away everything that's not relevant, package it together, and let's get this out the door as quick as possible. So hopefully that's a, a food, a food for thought for the future works that can um, and, and, and should come out of your time as a project manager in a number of different industries. Going on transferable skills, transferable skills again. Um, I then became the head of military talent at Jacobs. This sort of came out of me creating a very formalized white paper with all the good stuff I had learned from being a project manager and in sales to basically sell to the business that there should be a position uh, to bring in lots of ex-military into the business. Um, by using all the skills and, for example, that treasury note uh, and all those, all those really big clunky things I'd had to do, that allowed me to present it correctly in the right fraction to the hierarchy at Jacobs um, and to the senior leadership team out in Houston, Texas. By putting out on raw paper what the project could achieve, especially from a social value standpoint, and hence our relationship and good working relationship with build force, um, allows that social value tick that corporation is always after to be able to sing, sing a good news story. And then there's obviously the good news story for them that they've got someone on board who's reliable, going to work their hardest to get, get the job done. Most importantly, if they don't understand the work, they're going to put their hand up and say, I don't know what's going on. Um, and that's how a consultancy works and has a happy client because they're never upsetting the client because you're doing exactly as they wish and as they want. So Project, project Soft Landing was, was born then uh, about a year and a half ago now, a year and a bit ago now. And what the project offers is effectively is a, a, a hypercharged version of how to get your foot in the door at Jacobs. So, for example, you would do everything and the good work that BuildForce offers and, and suggests, CVs, et cetera, all the way through. It then comes to me or one of the team who works for me, and then we try to ping you into a particular category or role that we feel that we've got ready for the time when you're leaving, et cetera. And then we work you up into interview preparation. Um, if I'm going to be the interviewer, it comes to you by a proxy, and I have a couple of uh, members of the team who run through the interview questions with you um, as a mock and then they give you some top tips on how to do that, that interview prep and just sort of reiterating on, on, on the previous uh, previous slide pack the that preparation for interview is key it sounds um, well, I was saying, Chad standing in front of the mirror and going through your set questions of what they're going to ask you 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 will be given uh, so that mock interview pack and there are some tricky questions in there and it's about 
how to take that hard-earned military language and talent and understanding and lessons learned and translate that so that the interviewers who probably won't be from a military background for, for the wider industry um, on how they can understand what on earth you're talking about. So it's really important to do that. It, it, it feels awkward doing it, um, but certainly for, from a former Marines background, you know, uh, that's what I would expect any junior NCO, certainly who was getting ready to deliver a lecture, even if it was to his cohort or certainly to, to anything higher, that he would be practicing that in front of the mirror and it would run very slick. So that's the sort of level you've got to put yourself out there as. Um, my current role alongside being the head of military talent is a recruitment director at Jacobs. So I actively interview about 12 to 15 people a week, um, specifically aimed towards our defence sector, where, I'm, where we're always looking for integrated logistics management, project management, through life technical support, and project controls. Now I've realised that I've mentioned three roles there that don't have the word project management first and foremost. All of those roles have a element of project management requirement. Um, if you look at the likes of DNS, DIO, SDA, they all have a mandate of agile working 2021. Last time I checked, it's 2022, but they still have a requirement for all of their civil servants to be immersed in a uh, workplace of agile slash project management, correct modern methodologies of delivering um, procurement to the UK MOD. All of those roles that I mentioned then, integrated logistics, project controls, TTLS, we require people to join the business who have that project, who have a project management qualification in that role, so that, for example, we can have um, a couple of our logistics team writing a logistics procurement strategy for the client. They will write that strategy in the same format of thinking as a project manager so that when the bid is launched and everybody's happy and, and it's going, when it lands in the project manager's desk, it is already saving him or her time because they have had it delivered to them with everything already spelt out all the way down into time boxing and future planning which is really critical for us to speed up projects and really get projects moving. It also allows us to put that flex in the schedule should there be the, the unknown in, in the project which you can never account for. Just a couple of points um, from me on to what to what to utilise and what best to utilise. Um, so you're already on the right call. You're on the right call with Buildforce who truly are here to, to help you out. I didn't come through build force in, into industry. Um, I only found out about it after about three or four months of being outside of the Marines, but you're already one step ahead of me in, in essence of finding the right place. And they're going to be able to open the doors to many different parts of industry, such as the two parts of industry you see today. What I would say on the, the transition piece, I think everybody forgets that they've already made one huge, huge um, right hand or left hand turn in their life by joining the military. It takes a lot to leave the civilian world and join the military. I appreciate, you know, all cap badges have different strengths and, and, and some of them are seen as more difficult, some of them are seen as easier to, to achieve and get into. The actual part of being in the military is still a huge adjustment change. And you're just going to make that adjustment change again, albeit you're going to take with you a different set of values and a different set of working methodology that you would never have had before joining um, the military. So just make sure you take that sort of that grip with you, have that confidence to be able to sit down and, and sell yourself and be. Um, there's lots of great um, parts of, of, of the veterans networks that exist out there outside of build force um, piece, such as the employable app, which would allow you to make a whole profile on yourself and then it will help match you into roles and then you can utilize build force and the team to help you have that cv up and running and then you know, it's it becomes a sort of a, a community effort so every service leader who gets a job um it, it, it is a win the last point i'll make on that with the service leader getting a job understand your value in the workplace the what we saw on the our previous slides 
average of £50,000 as a project manager. Be very aware that any business that's worth their salt will know that you are a service lever of some, of some fraction and they will be able to claim back a percentage of your national insurance con contribution from the Treasury. And that works out at an average on the 50k marker of just shy of four and a half grand a year for the first year of your employment. So you are a cost saving to that business and hence why the marketplace is fired up at the moment to bring um, especially service leavers straight out of the Ministry of Defence and into um, the civilian workplace. So hold on to that, have a look about online if you're not familiar with it and then also have a look online at PPN06 which is the social value uh, scoring criteria which all major companies would have to play against within any government bid. Half of the documents all about what do you do for reservists, veterans, service leavers and spouses. There's a big ticket item. You are a bigger ticket item than you might realise in the in the market space. It might take you one or two turns of the wheel after you've landed in a company to figure out just how important that is uh, for everybody in the in industry who's trying to bring you on board. You can find me on LinkedIn, just Robert Kelly, Jacobs. You know, I come up on the bridge there. I've actually got a field force background in the background of that picture. So thanks for that one, Caroline. And more than happy to get anybody in for a chat, one to one chat with myself about future works at Jacobs. Um, and we can sort of filter down by region and by office if possible for, for getting you in, in the door. Fantastic, Fantastic, Rob. Thank you very much. If I could ask Michael to put his camera on as well, if you can join us. Hi there, Michael. If you do have a question, please raise your hand or switch your camera on. You're more than welcome to, to jump in. We've just got a few minutes for questions. Um, I'll kick off um, with a, a few. Michael, you, you said probably one of the most poignant things you said is don't worry, don't stress. As you start networking, it flows um, which would have been comfort or words of comfort to many. So just on that point then, what does good networking look like? Or for those that take that complete mind blank and think, I don't know anybody, um, what are the next steps? Um, yeah, so again, it, it really does depend. I mean, you can go to organisations that you're interested in. So if, you, you know, if, if you're interested in Lysander and um, Jacobs, then you can go on LinkedIn and just you know, um, start uh, tapping up those organisations and they'll identify all the people in those organisations. Or um, a lot of my networking was done through ex-contacts as well, you know, and also every time I spoke to somebody or I saw an interesting post, I would then reach out and connect with this individual um, and just have a little chat with them. Um, and like I say, it was just some of it was just uh, a couple of messages backwards and forwards. Um, and just talking about something that was posted on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is a great tool um, and, you know, I won't go into how it works and everything else like that, but if someone else likes it from us, you know, from your contacts, from it, someone else's post, it just expands exponentially. Um, and then you just you just go through and read through and spend time. And also you can, you can filter it to certain um, roles and organisations as well, and you can start um, networking that. So if you wanted a PM, then identify the, those type of PM roles. And I thought it was very useful in that regard. OK, and just another question, Michael. You sound as if your transition went well. You've really settled at Lysander. It sounds as if it's really, really worked out for you. Was that luck, judgment? How, how did you test the culture over there? Is it because you knew people? Uh, probably a mixture of everything on that on that list, mm -hmm. then, Angela. Uh, so, as I said, my my previous role stood me in an absolutely amazing position. You know, to get out after teaching project management and MS projects, and obviously my previous roles. But uh, networking through Bill Force and and the person that reached out to me is someone that I I actually um, identified before it was a, a gentleman called Michael Dryden, and who obviously was was quite involved with Build Force at that particular time. Um, and when I, like I say, I'd never never heard of Lysander before, um, and I wasn't too sure which organization to go left or right. Um, I was talking to some big, big companies, and it was just the opportunity. Once I started talking to them, they identified an opportunity for me. Um, 
it probably wasn't communicated that well as to how big it was, <laughs> which is a little bit daunting. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was it was the right time, right place, right project, you know, but also the right contacts as well. And Caroline did her amazing work by identifying, you know, companies that would suit me and it's worked perfectly, you know. And the thing that kind of interested me in Lysander was there was one other military person in Lysander. It was still a relatively, well, it is quite, you know, in, in regards to Jacobs, it's absolutely nowhere near the size of Jacobs. But the projects they're involved with, the one I'm working on is probably the biggest, if not one of the biggest in the whole of the UK um, that I'm delivering. Um, and they, they had enough faith in me to give me that straight out of the military you know and that was just off the back of my cv conversations and everything else like that um so yeah it was like i say it just kind of like the stars aligned at that particular time um but it's also through the amazing work that you guys did and um certainly linkedin as well and obviously the interview preps as well which obviously rob's alluded to probably a little bit better than i did um you know it is very valuable in preempting those um but Again, if you've ever taught, it's perfect experience because those curveball questions always come at you and uh, I find it very useful. No, oh, brilliant. And a question for Rob. Um, it was interesting to hear you say even after transitioning, you were still checking in to ensure that where you landed is what you wanted to do and it was meeting your expectations. So you spent time in project management, which would have created that solid foundation or bedrock um, into the rest of the Jacobs business. So on the thread then, what attracted you to sales above all the other departments within the huge European office? What was it that attracted you to, to work winning? I think it's, I, I was maybe missing at that stage the high, high pressure environment of being back in the Marines. I was looking for that, um, that sort of elitist, we must win. This must, this is a must win. When you hear a vice president in the business say this is a must win you think right happy days then what are we doing wow. 20 20 20 000 hours a week what, what, what do you want so it that, that's what i liked about it there is um effectively the sales team that i that i was in um in the, in the jacobs industry side or the stuff that jacobs plays in mostly is relatively um, calm and, and relaxed in comparison to say the likes of I don't know say IBM or or, or someone like that where it is you know dog eat dog sales um, <laughs> so it, it was probably just the nicest of, of, of the few to, to be involved with um, but yeah to, it finding those I like a high pressure thriving environment and that I certainly found it in, in the sales team and I was genuinely sad to leave my my sales team to, to take on um, the head of head of military recruitment and the head of military talent pieces at Jacobs uh, and it's something that I will always look to get back into um, and look at that the command and control element is there in the sales function especially if you've left as a senior NCO or above it is of no difference being at the back of the back of the stack and saying right you stop you go you come back in what are you even doing get come back <laughs> here, right start again so that yeah that that was the um the draw for me in, in that okay and for those that have maybe got a tx date looming and there's a few good options but just nothing quite that's hitting the mark yet do you think transitioning into a big organization and a project management role finding their feet and then making uh, taking steps from there is that would you suggest that is that i would say yeah. jacobs has an interesting position on this that our ceo wants everybody to have four full careers in jacobs before having to step out and go elsewhere so um an example of myself as you see pm sales recruitment talent acquisition recruitment director I can take it for other examples of pms into sales sales in, into pm pm into business development um to name a few but then there's also the chance of pm just in those different industries so yes defense is where i'm going to try and drop every single one of you into because that's what the <laughs> things need you might then think i cannot stand looking at a modern net laptop for another second i need to get out of this then i've got an environment and water team stacked up and ready a transport team stacked up and ready you all need project managers and we need that that transition of thought between all these different sectors 
to be able to grow as a business. Um, you know, we don't make anything. We've only got consultants. So if we've got consultants who are experienced in two or three different areas, especially if we've got anybody who's, who's nuclear sweat by that time, the world is your oyster. I've seen what the top project managers make in the nuclear world, and I promise you it's something you want to get into. Um, when putting bids together of those of that nature, it is um, it is tasty and makes the, the financial industry look, look, look poor. OK, a question has come in from James regarding PM courses and your experience. What are the benefits of APM over Prince? I think the easiest win is. Prince is something you're going to have to redo and he has a three or five year shelf life. I can't remember. APMP, PMQ as a sort of miniature degree is all, all, it's almost looked like a lifelong qualification and this industry recognizes it's certainly a hot ticket. Industry will also like that um, because they won't have to take you off any projects to retrain you in three years, five years time, even though it's four day refresh of course, four days is a lot of money in a consultancy for you to be off task. That would be my recommendation on that. I don't know, Michael, if you could maybe think anything different on that from, from your side. Yeah, obviously I've taught PMQ, so I know it pretty well. Um, certainly my my old organisation now have transitioned to Prince2. Um, so I think at the two, it's probably an easier qualification to hit and it's, it's it's more friendly, but it's essentially different terminology. And certainly if you did the Prince2, what you can do is get the Prince2 qualification and then you can do the PMQ at a later point. You will just do a reduced exam and it just tests you on the additional bits that the Prince2 doesn't cover. Um, so that might be a way around, you know, negotiating if you wanted to, you know, and then it might be that the organisation is willing to put you into the PMQ at a later point just for a one off hit, get it done and dusted and then that's way of covering it or as as Rob Riley says there, it's every five years that you're renewing that qualification and you've got to do the course all over again as well. You can't just go into it, you know, they're, they're quite stringent, it's a money capturing. So, you know, um, Axelos who run the Prince 2 is pretty much, you know, it's, it's money organisation and they want you obviously to do the courses and the exams all over again as well. So just on that, Michael, then were Lysander looking for either of these when you were applying for your role? Uh, not that I was aware of. I think I think um, they wanted at least one PM qual, um, or if not the qualification, certainly the training. And that's not to say that it's you know it's critical. It's just so you have an awareness about you know the the, the project management, certainly terminology. So when people are discussing elements in industry, you can relate it to you know what's a stakeholder management plan, what's a risk register, and you know that's stuff that can be taught anyway but it's you know it, it's certainly i know if, if we look at cvs we would like to see something on that or if not working towards the qualification but it's not an absolute showstopper okay and rob for you is it a requirement to have these qualifications at jacobs on my defense side uh, of life i do i need i need at least one um okay. depending on the level can depend on if it's a foundation or or a practitioner's um tick if it's a, a mid-level, so I certainly need one. The, the the problem I always say is that the, the guys and girls do such a good job in their, their transitions using their enhanced um, learning credits that I generally get uh, guys and girls with you know the whole suite, APMP, PMQ, Prince2, Agile Management of Risk, all in the locker. Just all they need is a step out the door. So the more you have, the better if you can find a training provider um, who can offer that. Um, we use Quantra, uh, who do actually fun deals, um, but there's lots out there um, to be said uh, and, to, and to get all, all the one under the belt. In the other side of Jacob's business, there, there is an actual requirement for a project management qualification, which it does genuinely help bump you up the CV stack. OK, perfect. Well, listen, thank you to Michael and Rob for their incredible contribution today and to our military community. This is an incredible second career. And as you've been advised today, you will be fine. So you're not alone. Caroline is here to support and guide you as you transition. So please get in touch if you have any questions and we'll help you take this further. So I'll pass back to Caroline for some insights and to close. 
Thanks, Angela. And, and guys, as I said, you are two of my favourites. Really enjoyed listening to that. Although I have to get out of my head the image of you both practising um, your lines in front of your mirror, you know, but we'll, we'll talk about that at another time. So I would just like to wrap up today by doing a call out for Armed Forces Day, which is coming up on the 25th of June. Bill Force is getting a team of walkers together. So uh, we're currently at about 15, a combination of service leavers, veterans and employers. We want that to get up to 20. Last year, we had a fab time. We had three generations of veterans swapping anecdotes and their war stories. It really was a lovely day. So it's a 15 mile walk, starting at the pub, ending at the pub. Uh, with some much needed refreshments courtesy of Bill Force and that's in Cranbourne so we're going to walk through the Dorset Hampshire countryside it really is a lovely walk um, so if you can join us please do if you can't join us then and you can su uh, support us we would recommend um, wholly welcome your donations just go to our website and donate there if you'd like to join us then e email info at billforce.org.uk so that's a wrap for today enjoy your day and um, we'll see you again soon and please do get in touch for further support thank you thanks michael thanks rob oh, thank you thank you very much